Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Apologies I didn't go to DCU, but I am a big fan. Bream across your president is certainly the finest president of our seven uh, public universities, and I've told him on many occasions. Hopefully my slides are going to come up, or I'm going to bore you to death. I guess just while I'm waiting for the slides to come up, why don't I um, give you a, a little bit of background. Um, uh, I, I studied law in Trinity uh, when I was the same age as most of you. The only thing I knew for sure was I absolutely had no idea what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So um, after finishing my law degree, I went from uh, law into the world of capital markets and finance. So joined an American investment bank called Morgan Stanley and spent my 20s working in finance. So, you know, had a great time, got to see a few years in London, a few years in Hong Kong, a few years in New York. Got to experiment across the various um, verticals in finance. So originally did mergers and acquisitions and then laterally did equity and debt capital markets. And I suppose got skilled up, but in truth, what I really learned, uh, you know, while traveling the world, enjoying myself and making a few quid, what I really learned was I really didn't want to work for a large corporate for the rest of my life. So uh, at the age of 30, in the late 90s, uh, I joined a small little Irish startup called Riverdeep. Can I get the slides up, guys? Sorry? Okay, we're off and running. Sorry about that. Um, so look, why don't I, you know, again, without boring you uh, too much and giving you too much technical jargon, why don't I try and over 15, 20 minutes give you my story, um, tell you what I've learned, tell you what I got right, tell you what I got wrong, um, and give you the observations of a 50-year-old man to a bunch of people in their early 20s. I'm not sure how useful that is ultimately, uh, because I'm at the very different stage of my journey to where you are in yours. But I think the most important thing I'd say to you from the outset is, you're not supposed to know what you want to do in your early 20s, and life's a journey. So embrace it and enjoy it. So just to get down to the specifics on, on my journey, uh, when I left banking in, uh, in the late 90s, uh, I got involved in a small little Irish startup called Riverdeep. Uh, and really with very little requisite knowledge about the world of education, but with lots of knowledge about the world of finance, I frankly got my first slice of luck when I was able to take that very small business public at the peak of the dot-com bubble. So we raised $130 million for what was in today's world, uh, frankly, probably even a, an angel-financed uh, company. We probably wouldn't have even been ready for what in, in today's world would be deemed Series A financing. Uh, and that was really the beginning of my journey. And again, just kind of points to little life lessons to point out. You know, as and when you get into the world of startups, and I would applaud you and encourage you to do it, don't think you've achieved anything when you raise the money. When you raise the money, all you've really done is, you know, we're all good, we're all good. Uh, when, you, when you raise the money, all you've really done is lost a little bit of control, brought in an external investor, and set a whole new set of expectations. So I guess my journey began, you know, in many ways at the, at the, at the precipice because, you know, in effect, the first time I really ran the company was when we were suddenly a public company. Very early stage business, but suddenly with public investors co-listed on, uh, on the Dublin Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. And so what I really had to do then was figure out how to use this money and how to use the public currency of being public to try and create something of real scale, because obviously I had raised a lot of money, so I needed to build something big to give a return on that capital. So we went about it uh, over the next several years. Uh, between the, for the next few years as a public company, we used our public currency to buy seven different companies, spent about $250 million on acquisitions, buying different educational software businesses around the world, uh, as well as we used the money that we'd raised to build out our own organic product line. Uh, and in a very short space of time, we actually became the largest in the world of what we were doing. But what we were doing was selling into the public school system, primarily in the US, and most of the money was still going towards textbooks, and we felt that we were really only around the fringes. So in 2006, uh, I actually started discussions with one of the large US textbook publishers, thinking, frankly, we would possibly get bought by them or we would do some sort of a merger. And in fact, it resulted in us doing a reverse uh, acquisition of them for three and a half billion dollars. Uh, most of the way I financed this was using a mixture of debt and equity. Uh, and in fact, in 2006, that worked so well. Then in 2007, we actually bought one of the other very large textbook publishers called Harcourt Bray Shabanovich. So in simple terms, over the sp space of seven, seven years, we had taken a small little Irish startup, taken it public, raised a lot of capital, used our public currency to buy a lot of businesses, and then through th two very significant reverse acquisitions, we'd suddenly become the largest player in the world. So we were selling more textbooks, educational software, or professional development services to the US public school system and to, U and to public school systems around the world. And when I say school, I'm referring to primary and secondary, I'm not talking about tertiary, uh, than any other company in the world. 
Um, and, and then, unfortunately, the global financial crisis hit in 2008, and I ended up with a very different series of, of transactions that I had to undertake, which was really the bottom of this slide, talks to having to restructure the business, um, but ultimately having to be able to split the business between the US enterprise, which I ceded control to the creditors, uh, the non-US business, which I kept myself, uh, and control to this day, and a piece of that uh, which I sold um, to Bain Capital, one of the world's largest private equity funds, uh, a couple of years ago uh, for $145 million, which I suppose financially rehabilitated me and allowed me to start to recapitalize a lot of these different ventures that I've been continuing to pursue. So the main, the main corporate entity that I control today is a company called Rise Global. Uh, we operate a business ourselves teaching young kids uh, English in Korea with about 5,000 students. Um, about 20 centres, about 800 employees. Um, and it's growing very significantly. It's very similar to the business that we built in China and sold to Bain Capital, uh, as well as we four global joint venture partners, uh, one specifically in Japan, another in Indonesia, another covering Vietnam, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, and fourthly covering the Middle East, specifically Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, and Bahrain. <laughs> No, no, no video, no video now. <laughs> um, uh, I've also in the last couple of years been, um, been doing some domestic ventures. So together with North Anglia, uh, which is the world's largest uh, operator of international schools, they operate 58 international schools around the world. Um, I've just done a joint venture with them. It's about a 50 million dollar capital and 50 million euro capital investment, and we've just opened the first international school uh, in South Dublin. Uh, we opened in September. We've got a couple of hundred students, and uh, ultimately we've capacity for 800 students. And the hope, frankly, with this project is it's going to be part of a systemic reform movement to really work and engage with the Irish public school system, which, in my opinion, is no longer fit for purpose. But that's for a, for a different day. Uh, I've also more recently set up a joint venture with one of the world's largest pathway businesses. Pathway businesses are companies that run private colleges or indeed work with public universities. And in fact, our joint venture is working with Dublin City University today, helping bring in international students. So these are students from outside the EU, students that obviously pay full tuition, and that's obviously a source of fiscal stimulus for the university and a way to subsidize domestic tuition rates. So um, we, we, I set up this joint venture about 18 months ago. Uh, this year, we expect to bring about 500 students into the Irish system, uh, into Maynooth DCU on the public university side, and then into Sligo IT and DIT on the IT side. Uh, our hope long term, obviously, is to ultimately do it a bit like New Zealand does it, and just do a full public-private partnership with the entire system. Um, and this year, as I said, we, we hope to, we'll bring in about 500, worth about 50 million to the economy. And long term, we, we would hope to be bringing in a couple of thousand a year. Um, Again, just to kind of chron chronologize my history, and I don't, I'm not telling you all of this to impress you, frankly, because it's had plenty highs and it's had plenty lows. I'm telling it to you because to create scale, um, you know, it, there, are, there are highs and lows, and I think it's incredibly important that there's a common denominator that sees you through that and that kind of keeps, you, you know, keeps your emotions in check as you undertake these journeys, because no journey uh, in the world of entrepreneurship is linear. So what I learned over the last 20 years, having done a lot of things, having done a lot of different financings, having done a lot of different types of transactions, most of which were big, uh, having had, as I said, highs and lows, is I've learned a lot of lessons and we've invested a significant amount of capital. And I guess just to quickly quote a high, a high was a business we set up in China. Uh, we set it up in 2007, early 2008. Uh, frankly, it was completely insulated from the global financial crisis because it was a play on you know, Chinese middle-class consumers looking for Western education. Uh, and so we were, we were delivering a very unique product into the Chinese market at the time. Um, we did it very much with a kind of a, a very strong Western USP. We got the pro program accredited by the Harvard School of Education. We created a real differentiation in the market. And on a five million investment, we ultimately exited five years later for 145 million. That's a high. Rest assured, there have been lows. So uh, over the course of 2009 and 10, you know, having in 2008 built up a very, very significant business, which I owned and controlled, um, you know, we were about 60% of the US uh, public spend on instructional materials and software. Um, we were a $3 billion business, making about a billion dollars of profits. Uh, and then suddenly we found ourselves in the face of you know, an unprecedented headwind. So specifically, you know, state departments of education across the US, so State Department of Education, California, New York, Texas, Florida, et cetera, et cetera, all had their funding cut. And so something that was supposed to be you know, unimaginable, was certainly unprecedented, became the reality of my world. So you know, having frankly delivered the specific things that we were supposed to deliver, and again, little life lesson, some things happen that are just a bit unfair, and you just have to you know, play the cards you're dealt. Uh, the reality the reality is, you know, we found ourselves uh, having to restructure the business. 
And so what we did was, over the course of two years, we engaged with our creditors. We were very transparent. We were very honest. And most importantly, we respected you know, the rules of risk. And ultimately, the rules of risk are the guys at the bottom of the hierarchy. You know, debt, secure debt, unsecured debt, you know, quasi-equity, full equity, common equity sits at the bottom. So the founders, you guys stand to make the most, but you guys also stand to lose the most. And so ultimately, I ceded control to my creditors, um, licked off my wounds, but in the process saved 4,500 jobs globally and saved a 200-year-old business. And I suppose, ultimately, what, what, what do I believe in? What, what has the core team that's worked with me for the last 20-odd years? Because I've had a, you know, half a dozen guys uh, and gals working with me throughout this journey. Um, you know, I suppose what's kept us sane, because there have been certainly testing moments of quasi-insanity, um, is our belief. You know, our belief in uh, education, um, specifically our belief in wanting to disrupt education, um, trying to bring a sense of you know, innovation, much abused term that it rightly is, um, to the world of education, and really just setting out the values for which we stand. Uh, and throughout all of the last 20 years, throughout the series of different corporate carnations and reincarnations, we've really stuck to our principles. Uh, and those principles, some of them are altruistic and philanthropic, some of them are noble with high degrees of integrity, and some of them are pure profiteering, where, in my opinion, for-profit education and not-for-profit ed education actually are highly, highly synergistic and quite symbiotic. Uh, and frankly, we've been consistent in our beliefs. Whether you be believe or respect our beliefs, it's somewhat irrelevant. We've believed in them, and it's what has kept us you know, um, focused and has been our common goal. And to give you a sense, frankly, beyond a belief system of what any business needs, and this is where I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings late in an afternoon, but there is no silver bullet to the world of startup. It's, it's frankly, it's a lot of very detailed analytical homework. So if anybody out there thinks you have a brilliant idea, that's fine, but what you've got to turn it into is a brilliant strategic plan and ultimately you know, an operating plan that's realistic and that's ultimately financeable. So you know, specifically, you know, my latest company, Rise Global, we have very specific uh, strategic goals and pillars. So we have nine specific pillars um, that we build our market positioning around. Those are highly differentiated. Um, so it's everything from how we teach, the way in which we teach, the products that we teach, the immersion that we're offering versus our competitors. So it's deeply analytical. It's a SWOT analysis against the competitors as well as against the more existential issues in the marketplace. And ultimately, you know, it is our strategic vision and goal and how we, we provide our, our product and our market USP. And then we translate that into, again, nine very specific product goals uh, and nine very specific product modules as to, again, how we compete and beat our competitors. And I won't bore you because it's not that interesting for you guys to get a deep immersion into the world of Asian English language learning and how we compete relative to Disney and some of the other companies that we compete against, but it's granular. The point I'm really trying to make to you is it's highly granular. It, you know, it's not, from, it's not uh, on the hoof. It's not you know, flying from the seat of our pants. It's, it's based on deep analytical research, some of which you get wrong, which is where you pivot. Right? But in the end of the day, you've got to have data-driven decision-making inside any company, irrespective of whether it's big or small. And so really what these slides show you is, again, they're not pretty, but what they show you is there's lots of granularity behind the specific ways in which we compete on a product level, and ultimately that rolls into a strategic vision built on nine pillars, which ultimately then it's all about people delivering and executing to the plan. However, I suppose, in many ways, I'm somewhat humbled and embarrassed by even giving you a lecture on entrepreneurship, because the truth is, I'm probably the wrong age profile. Um, as I said, I'm 20 years into it, you're at the beginning of it. Um, I'm somewhat jealous. Um, I say somewhat, because I'm not sure I could relive the last 20 years all over again. Um, but, but I think what's more challenging for you, frankly, than possibly for me when I set out on my journey, is what the, what the economists call this inflection point of skilled, biased, technical change. And that's kind of fan fancy uh, economic jargon for innovation. So what's coming through you know, the world of innovation, which really, you know, it's been going on for, frankly, as long as homo sapiens have been getting upright. Um, but particularly, I think, since the Industrial Revolution, through technological innovation and, and transformation, efficiencies have been created that have been constantly transforming the workplace. So, you know, so the Lumites of 200 years ago thought that the wool mills wouldn't work. You know what? They did. They put a lot of people out of business, but ultimately they, they, they spun the wool quicker and easier and more faster and more efficiently. Well, I think today the parallel is even more daunting. 
because you know the confluence of artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, social media, Moore's Law, you know, uh, global economics. Um, it, it means that the changes are exponential. And what I think that means for you is it means that you have to think very carefully about what marketplace you're targeting. Because today's marketplace may not be tomorrow's marketplace. And I think specifically the, the, the data point that I think you should all remember, as you sit and you, you quite rightly deliberate over business plans and where, where you might find your place in the global kind of entrepreneurship ecosystem, is 60% of the jobs in 2030 don't exist today. Now, my main job is talking to educators, and that's a, st a stat I always use, because I say how we can continue to teach people the same way to the same age-based, subject-based, Victorian-based, high-stakes, tested-based approach is beyond me. Because, I mean, the World Economic Forum came out most damningly of all recently saying 20th century education will simply not work in the 21st century. So the reality is my main job is I try and innovate and reform uh, and, and ultimately transform education around the world in different ways through these different projects. But I think the question for all of you as aspiring entrepreneurs is, what's your marketplace? Because your marketplace today won't necessarily be your marketplace tomorrow. And particularly, what's your skill set to launch your startup? Because again, you're traditional, you may be great at math today, and the gold, the, you know, the gold standard for all the Irish in the audience is get a H1 in your leaving certificate higher level and it gets you the extra 20, 25 CAO points. That counts for nothing in the world of entrepreneurship, and it doesn't mean that you can read the crystal ball as to what's going to happen over the next 12 years as we massively migrate our workplace from, from uh, as I said, you know, where it is today to the 60% plus. You know, so, so almost you know, over one out of every two jobs is going to change. It's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary challenge, you know, but it's an, also an extraordinary opportunity for you. Uh, and I guess you know, it, it's what Larry Katz, a famous Harvard economist, calls, you know, it's a race between technology and education. And what you ideally want to do is, if you want to win the race, is if you can leverage your technology, because many of you in the room are, are technology experts, leverage that technology expertise, but don't forget that you also need to develop your skills. And maybe by way of example, um, what I thought I'd do is play you a short video. Um, this is actually a startup uh, of, of a, an Irish, a very Irish successful entrepreneur based in Florida. Um, and he's a guy with very strong views on how to teach entrepreneurship. Uh, and in many ways, he's probably the guy who should be standing in front of you giving you this talk, not me. Um, because he's actually just set up a startup in, in partnership with one of the high schools uh, in Florida, where he lives in Orlando. Working with kids aged, you know, students aged 13 through 18, so it's a high school, it's not, it's not a college. Um, and it's specifically trying to figure out how do you teach the appropriate skills to become an entrepreneur. You know, I, I don't think it's course-based. I don't even think it's program-based. I'm certainly not sure it's degree-based. But I think in his view, and, I, and I, I'm inclined to agree with him, uh, it's really about teaching empowerment. It's about teaching, uh, and he specifically you know, looks at the world through uh, relationships, mentoring, project-based work, pivoting, and ultimately pitching. Ultimately, the ability to pitch your idea, because ultimately that's what means you can get financial support, which ultimately means you've got the money to be able to do it. Um, but what, 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 what that really means is what he's teaching you is the powers of critical thinking, the powers of problem solving, and the ability to frankly think on your feet and talk on your feet. Uh, and it's, it's a very successful startup. I think it's a great idea and it's a great aspiration. But just to give you a sense of it, I thought I'd play you a short video of how he sees, he, how he sees the world. So can I play the video, please? We live in a time where one idea can change the world. But the truth is, today's students aren't learning all the skills they need to take on the endeavours and necessities inherent in being an entrepreneur. More important, being entrepreneurial might just be the most important skill people need in a 21st century economy. That's why the Startup Studio is empowering young people through engaging curriculums that merge creative problem solving and design thinking to unlock potential and show students how to build brilliant ideas into new startups, all for the purpose of helping them learn the power of creativity and the power of self. At the Startup Studio, we strive to help students uncover real value propositions that can solve real problems. Being an entrepreneur means understanding the artistry in innovation, 
and being an innovator means understanding what an entrepreneur undertakes every single day. By nourishing young minds and preparing the professionals of tomorrow to tackle the questions that stand between us and a brighter future, the Startup Studio is the essential educational bridge communities need everywhere. To learn more about our curriculums, go online to www.jointhestartupstudio.com today. So let me, um, just in, in concluding, let me give you a couple of observations, a couple of truisms, and then ultimately a list of what you know, I, I, I gen genuinely mean uh, as heartfelt, honest advice to all of you. Uh, I guess a couple of, uh, couple of truisms. Uh, failure is not the opposite to success. It is the stepping stone to success. Don't do a startup if you're not a risk taker. Don't do a startup if you've got thin skin. Don't do a startup if you're very sensitive. Okay, it's the wrong world for you. Go become a lawyer, go get a job, you know, go join the workforce, there's nothing wrong with it. But if you wanna be an entrepreneur, recognize that you're entering a big, bad, ugly world where you're gonna get battered and bruised and it's about staying upright and staying in the fight. Um, so that would be one observation. Second observation is for me, entrepreneurship, it's a bit like theology. It doesn't matter what you believe in, it doesn't matter if you believe in nothing. Nothing in itself is a theology. Uh, but I think what is important is you need to decide what you do believe in uh, and you need to decide where you're going because it is a journey. It is not a formula. It's not a cookie cutter uh, process. Uh, it, is, it, it evolves, it twists and turns and it meanders and let no successful entrepreneur tell you otherwise. Um, the third thing I guess I would say before just showing you a list uh, is it's okay, you're not supposed to know everything. So lean on your network, be it your, be it your peers, uh, be it your parents, uh, be it you know, mentors that you've met throughout your life, either personal or professional or both, but seek help. Relationships are at the core of any successful project. I guess specifically on the list itself, um, and again, I don't know if you can read this from the, um, from the back, but it's designed to just be, on one level, apologies, it's a little bit of a, a motherhood and apple pie list, but I guess it speaks to how entrepreneurship and, and how entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurialism really works. It's not a magic formula. And so I suppose point number one, there is no silver bullet. I wish there were. I could have saved myself an awful lot of time, energy, and money. Um, it's, you know, it's really about a lot of different things done well, simultaneously, uh, and then ultimately attention to detail with great people around you to help you pull it off. Uh, and so you can't cut corners. So when some guy, some you know, fellow student comes up and says, oh, let's do it this way, let's, you know, let's not go through the traditional processes of the building blocks and rubrics of how you, how you create a startup, trust me, you know, the, sh the shortest way is never, the sh is never really the shortest way. It, you know, ultimately, it's, it's a route to failure. Um, point number two, definition and, and differentiation. Y you've got to decide you know, wh what it is you're trying to do. You know, people often default to thinking entrepreneurship is about profiteering. It's about making something that makes money so you can sell it and make lots of money. That's not true. So, social entrepreneurship is frankly one of the reasons why I'm standing here because I'm a great fan of the Ryan Academy and what they do on the social entrepreneurship side. Um, you know, so is it, is it about creating efficiencies or creating money or creating sustainability or ideally creating all of the above? I mean, that's one of the things I've quite enjoyed about working in the world of for-profit education. You know, we're not making cigarettes, we're not making widgets, we're not doing anybody any harm. People may not like our products and our ideas and our offerings and our services, but ultimately, we're trying to make education a bit better. Um, so I think you've got to decide where, you know, what are the metrics for what you're trying to do? And then you've got to figure out how do you differentiate yourself? So I, I put up those busy slides just to try and show you, you've got to think it through. And it's like building a house, you know, the, cur the current fiasco with our, with our children's hospital is a great example of, you know, when you don't do the planning right, when you try and short circuit the planning, when you corrupt the planning process, bad things come out of that, right? So you cannot short circuit anything. You can't filibuster the process. You've got to respect the integrity of it. And I know that's very boring and it's very dull and it's from a middle-aged man telling you all the things you don't want to hear, but it's the reality of it. You know, you've got to actually go through the process of preparing and planning. You know, the best chairman I had, who was certainly not a man I particularly enjoyed working for, but he was certainly the best chairman I had. And he would literally not start a board meeting if he hadn't received the papers 48 hours in advance. And everything was always benchmarked to three documents. 
a three-year strategic plan, a two-year operating plan, and a one-year budget. Right? Now, I think the world has moved on from being quite that formulaic, but not a lot. And particularly if you take in external capital, be it debt capital, be it equity capital, or be it a hybrid of, 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 uh, of in-between, the reality is, you know, it's another point on this list. You've got to be able to hold yourself accountable, because ultimately third-party capital will hold you accountable. And what that means is governance. It means respecting that, you know, Okay, you mightn't want to wear a suit and a tie and you know, have to clock in and out, but the reality is there still needs to be a culture of accountability inside your organization, no matter how big or small it may be. Um, another point on this list, uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So slow down. The exuberance of youth is fantastic and I applaud it, but don't let it overtake you because it's a long journey um, and, and you need that energy. So keep physically and mentally fit and keep those energy levels high because they will be tested and challenged. Uh, and look. The most important uh, point on this slide is execution. It's about you know, execution. It's about attention to detail. It's about all the small stuff. Uh, and the only way you can execute is with the right people, uh, with the right trust levels amongst your team, uh, and frankly, with the right incentives, uh, both financial as well as uh, other. And th those other incentives may be work-life balance, maybe people wanting to work remotely, you know, whatever those different incentives packages are. Again, it goes back to my point about, about metrics. You know, figure out what it is you're trying to do and what you're trying to build and the value set behind it, and then align and incentivize accordingly. It, I think the world has moved on from it being purely around, around profit. Values, you know, I, I think, frankly, too much Irish entrepreneurship and too much of the Irish startup mentality has been around you know, trying to create something to flip. And one of the disappointments for me is, you know, with as bright you know, a, 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 a youth as we have, with the level of startups that we have, with the number of great startups that we've done, I think we generally, you know, most Irish startups have sold out too early. You know, I would challenge somebody in this audience to be the next great Irish entrepreneur that builds and keeps and maintains and continues to build something. You know, do we have the next Michael O'Leary in this room? Somebody who's going to build something great and going to make it his life's work or her life's work to ultimately for it to be a global company and a global uh, employer and a global influencer. You know, startups don't always have to be, you do an angel round, you do a friends and family round, you do a series A financing, B, C, and you flip it the minute you can. You know, startups can be if your values are different, if your definition and your differentiation is different, and if your aspirations and ambitions are big enough, a startup can turn into something truly great. And we have a handful of really global leading indigenous companies that can take a bow in that regard. Second last point, luck. Luck, luck, luck. It goes back to my point about theology. You know, pray to whatever God you believe in. You know, I, I'm not judgmental, but pray for luck because every project needs luck. Luck may be hiring the right person, luck may be pivoting early, making your mistake, learning from your failure. Uh, luck may be you know, getting access to capital at a time when you didn't necessarily deserve it. Uh, luck may mean you know, that you pivot away from doing one thing and do another. But you do need your fair slice of luck. Uh, and lastly, but not least, uh, and this is really the note on which I want to leave you, is carpe diem. Go for it. I applaud every one of you in this room that's thinking about doing a startup. It's not easy. Uh, it's not for the faint-hearted. Uh, in many ways, you're signing up to you know, a more turbulent life, uh, but it's a life I wouldn't change for anything. I, as I said, I spent my 20s working for large-scale multinationals, getting overpaid as somebody in my 20s. Had a great time, traveled the world, paid very little tax, couldn't get over. My dad thought I was dealing drugs. Couldn't get over that an American investment bank was paying an unqualified lawyer, you know, hundreds of thousands and ultimately millions to be a young investment banker. Don't miss a day of it. Love the fact that I get up and I work for myself. Love the fact that I've made a fool of myself. Love the fact that I keep picking myself up and figuring it out. Uh, so I applaud you. I encourage you to do it. Uh, you know, the world needs more people like you. The world doesn't need more uh, Irish lawyers. Good luck. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Um, you have any questions from the floor before I ask one or two? Okay, I'll pop, I'll pop straight in. Um, Mary, a lot of our uh, audience here are going to go into um, grad programs that come to the point where they're going to decide whether they're going to be an entrepreneur or go into grad programs. Uh, what's your thoughts? Like, what are the skills that, what would be the benefit of going into a grad program versus an entrepreneur or vice versa? Yeah, well, again, I can only give you my, my real example. So um, I did a graduate training program at Morgan Stanley, and then typically what happened after the first two years of the graduate training program is they asked certain people you know, to leave, thanks but no thanks. They asked certain people to go do an MBA. We think you've got lots of potential, but we'd like you to grow up a little bit. Uh, and then you know, some of us got lucky enough to just be able to, con uh, to continue. I, I continued 
you know, had I really thought that through? Not particularly. I continued because it was just the opportunity cost of not continuing, uh, and I was enjoying what I, what, I, what, I, um, what I was doing. I suppose it goes back to my earlier point. I, I think doing traditional MBA programs, uh, and I don't want to slight you know, the world of public education as I, as I stand here in a DCU's uh, uh, lecture hall, uh, but I think you need to, I, I just, I'd caution you, you know, signing up to these incredibly expensive MBA programs to, to frankly learn quite traditional skills through quite traditional structures in a world that's, you know, changing at the pace at which it's changing. I, I think it's, it's, you know, it, it's not clear to me that the return on capital is there. So on balance, if, 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 you know, what I would say to somebody is, you know, provided you can fund yourself, you're probably best off to kind of learn on the hoof. You know, make your mistakes, pivot, hopefully, you know, hopefully some of them work and away you go. But I think, you know, the school of life is possibly the greater teacher than, the, the, than kind of um, business school at the moment. And what would be your advice for people who, you know, college nowadays seems to be quite theory-based, uh, as opposed to practicality. What would be your thoughts on thought learning versus self-learning? Yeah, I think, look, like most things, uh, it's my point about no silver bullet. It, the reality is it's a mixture of both. You know, um, I think this notion that we can all live in this big, lovely, constructivist world where nobody's held accountable and it's all fluffy, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's a little unrealistic. I mean, the reality is, you know, publication, public education has to be built around some structures. I don't think the Leaving Certificate is fit for purpose anymore, but in the end of the day, you still need some form of high-stakes testing to figure out, you know, how to differentiate people. And, and really, as much as aptitude, uh, it's really about figuring out people's application because it's no coincidence that the people who work harder do better. Uh, and that's true, you know, that's a constant through life. So I think, I think some of it, you know, it, it has a place. But look, nothing, nothing beats, as I said, the school of life and the ability to self-teach. You know, but, but I think self-learning, self you know, the, the, one, the one risk I would, I, would, I, would, um, I would caution people towards is it's incredibly important you don't believe your own bullshit, right? You know, and particularly when you end up running a big company where you end up with people who are highly sycophantic around you and everybody nodding sagely and wisely and telling you how smart you are and you keep getting the wrong results. You know, that's, that's not a great outcome either. I think, I think Einstein called that insanity, to do the same thing again and again and expect a different outcome. So the, the reality is I think it's important to have great mentors. And if there's one thing I look at throughout my career, I mean, ironically, I'm now at the age where I'm, I'm the mentor, but for many years throughout my 20s and 30s, I had just fantastic people, professionally and personally, who were incredibly generous with their time and their counsel in mentoring me. All right, thanks a million. Okay, take Pleasure. care. Thanks.